Good afternoon, everyone. If you could take your seats, please. We'll get started. Welcome back for our final panel of the day. So we, we've all been watching Ukraine. We heard some, some great comments and some lessons learned from our last panel about Ukraine. Uh, we've, we've been watching China's actions in the Indo-Pacific and, and really questioning implications on the future of war. So for our last session of the day, we've assembled a great panel to discuss the changing character of warfare. So I'll turn it over to our moderator. Our moderator today is Lieutenant Commander Nicole Winjet, the Assistant Dean of Student Life and Support, Site Supervisor and Adjunct Professor of Homeland Security and Criminal Justice at Campbell University. Nicole, over to you. Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I am very pleased to introduce our panel. Um, starting to my right, uh, joining us as of July 8th from a joint tour in DC, uh, General Andrew Pappas, who is the Commanding General of Forcecom. We have Major General Christopher Leneve with the 82nd Airborne Division. One of our NATO allies, Polish Major General Adam Yokes, the DCG for Interoperability in our Army's Fifth Corps. And finally, Dr. Sean Mathait, a distinguished author and professor and I've been told a former All-American paratrooper. So welcome, thank you all for joining us today. We are gonna ask each panel member to give a short introduction um, to our topic, which in case you hadn't noticed was changing character of warfare. And then we will open up the floor to questions. General. Oh, thank you. Uh, as identified, uh, Drew Pappas, current commander of ForceCom, got a good two weeks under my belt. But in this role, one of the key pieces, and we've talked about it is, we are solely focused on readiness, readiness of the force. And it is our requirement you know, to fight and win our nation's wars. You'll hear that refrain from me continuously in every forum that I talk about. But what does that mean when we talk about readiness to fight that, the future fights? And you'll see that there's a temporal nature of it. You've got the modernization, you have the readiness, and you have those that are ready for, a, for a employment. But it's the fight tonight, fight today, that which you see over in Europe, that which you see that throughout the indo pacom AOR, but the temporal nature of it is also, what does the future fight look like? And how do we build through modernization and readiness for that future fight? And balancing the requirements that we have out there. Uh, as you identified, I just came off of a, a joint job. Uh, and in that joint realm of both as the, the three, then as the director, one of the key things that we focused on is the global force management. And that's the commitment of all resources to the demands across the world, whether it's one nurse, or a carrier strike group that all works its way up through the, the Secretary of Defense. But the, one of the things that I will tell you is the demand is not going down. The COCOM requirements continue to increase because of the, what we ask of the combatant commanders. So as you start to look at the friction inherent of readiness, because in order to meet those requirements, the force elements necessary from the Army are the same ones that we're looking to modernize, the same ones that have to go through the training, and yet are being pulled to meet the current requirements of today. So as we talk about the changing character war for the future, how do we, f how do we find a way to navigate through that so that we make sure that we meet the re requirements for the combatant commander today, yet still maintain the capacity and capability to modernize and prepare for the fight of the future? Thank you. Thank you, sir. General Leneve? Well, first off, General Brown, thank you. Uh, thanks, sir, for uh, just giving the opportunity to be here today. I look out across the crowd, there's a lot of uh, my personal heroes, a lot of mentors out here, and then you look out across in the back, and uh, I got the distinct honor and privilege uh, to serve with 19,000 paratroopers uh, in the 82nd Airborne Division. The greatest thing about the 82nd, uh, it's a little leadership laboratory that a bunch of paratroopers are always thinking about new things to apply at the cutting edge of the battlefield. And we're taking a hard look at our lessons learned uh, coming off of our recent deployment. We just got home, uh, you know, some of us from Poland, uh, while the rest of the division is, uh, you know, doing exactly what the boss said, which is staying razor sharp forever. The nation would uh, need uh, our, uh, our paratroopers uh, to uh, go into harm's way uh, for the nation. So it's an honor to be here. Uh, to talk, you know, anywhere from, you know, how we see the character of war, you know, in this first inning uh, that we see right now in the, in the current conflict, or how we see the division transforming uh, if, in the near future in order to meet, uh, you know, some of the, uh, the threats that's posed to us. But it's an honor and a privilege just to be up here uh, on the stage. 
especially with uh, Forcecom Commander and, and uh, you know, a great partner uh, coming out of Poland, uh, serving alongside uh, a lot of your, uh, your teammates and your Army. So I appreciate being here. Thank you, sir. General Jokes? I am Major General Jokes. I am DCGI for the fifth U.S. Corps. Uh, last year, the 1st of August, I, uh, I was assigned on this uh, position. I am very honorable to be uh, the, the DCGI for the, for the fifth U.S. Corps. And as you know, last year, the fifth U.S. Corps achieved full operational capability, was certified as the Warfighting Corps. And a couple, mo a couple months later, the fifth Corps very quickly uh, was deployed to Europe uh, to, to show the commitment of the U.S. troops to the uh, European NATO, NATO alliance. That's why I am very proud to be, to be, to be the part of, of, this, of this very, very good team. Uh, generally, uh, I, I didn't know that uh, in, very soon I will be practically engaged in this interoperability building in the fifth core. It's, be, it's very interesting, you know, the fifth U.S. core is designated for the European theater. Uh, it's, not the NATO, it's not in the NATO structure, in the NATO command structure, in the NATO force structure, but uh, has to be very interoperable with our NATO, uh, NATO partners. That's why talking about the nature of the battlefield, nature of warfare, we have to talk about the interoperability and how for the, for the future uh, operation, for the future war, how we have to prepare our forces to be fully interoperable with our NATO alliance. And I am looking forward for, for your question and good dis discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, General. Dr. McFate? So it's great to be back here. I I showed up here 30 years ago as a young platoon leader full of piss and vinegar in 2504. Uh, and my lieutenant, my battalion commander was Lieutenant Colonel Stan McChrystal. My brigade commander was John Abizade, followed by David Petraeus. I got smoked for four years doing PT on Sicily <laughs> Drop Zone. Petraeus would jump in his like pull-up bars in the talk, and that was, you know, in nods doing it. Um, so now I'm a paratrooper gone bad. I've become a professor um, at National Defense University, Georgetown, Syracuse University, and I'm at a think tank. Uh, some would say an oxymoron, but we'll leave that aside. And let me first explain what the character of war means, because that's like a code word. And think of it this way. There's two things, the nature of war and the character of war. The nature of war never changes. War, at its nature, is armed politics. <clears throat> armed politics. And it's, it's the same where it's the Peloponnesian War 2,400 years ago or Ukraine today. But how it's waged is always changing. The technology, the leadership, the geopolitical circumstances. And that's called the character of war. Or think about nature of war is, you know, you know it's war versus warfare. Warfare is the character of war. And, the character of war is changing, as you know, and that's what this topic is about. In my opinion, warfare, or the character of war, is getting more sneaky. And the reason it's getting more sneaky is because we have lived in an information age for the last 30 years. We will continue to do so in the next 30 years because we all have things like this. We're, we're now reporters, we're now photographers, videographers, publishers, producers, you name it. And if you, if you want to wage war and get away with it, you do it, not ben, you do it beneath the threshold of international media. Because once international media spots you, it's like a, it's like a spotlight, things get difficult. It's, it's why, that's the difference between why Russia succeeded in 2014, they ran a sneaky war against Ukraine, versus today, where they used sort of conventional war at first it failed, and now they've pivoted to something that's a little different. So warfare is getting more sneaky, and what that means, we can talk about it, is you don't have to change the means, but the ways have to change so that it's about plausible deniability, and if it's us against, say, Russia or China, we can do two things. We can create implausible deniability, 
and, and do intelligence pre-bunking, like we saw before the Ukraine war, saying they're going to do this, this, and this. Or, and some of you may enjoy this, if Putin says those Wagner Group mercenaries are not really there because it's plausible deniable, well, then who will miss them if they disappear tomorrow morning, right? So we have to get sneaky as well. And I don't think, you know, this is not conventional war. This is not a fight that F-35s can win. Um, but the problem is this. We all know from like the church committee in the 70s that secrets of democracy are not compatible. So how do we, how does a democracy engage in sneaky or secret of war without losing its democratic soul? That's the national question we should be discussing, not how many Ford class carriers we need. But also, what happens if we don't try? So that's the question I think as a nation we have to have a discourse about and not about platforms of you know, the, the shopping list for the Pentagon. Thank you. Thank you. General Pappas, if I may start with a question for you. You have discussed um, readiness, and I believe a, a few other people mentioned that. Recognizing you're still early in your 90-day assessment, how are you thinking about readiness, and how is it important to the changing character of warfare? Well, I think the key component to that, and I've used the type, you know, readiness, you've got 1.0 and the 2.0 approach to it. The 1.0, as you've seen, and with the guidance that came out from ForceCon previous, and I'm a big supporter of it, we saw that we started to migrate away from the fundamentals. And we'd worked to work at higher level echelon training, but we worked a little bit too quickly. So though we'd get to the point where you're doing battalion or brigade live fires, what we hadn't done is spent the time at the team, the squad, or the platoon live fires. So you weren't finding our actions on the objective or being executed to the level of proficiency we needed to be to meet the success on an actual battlefield. So we took a little step back, and that one dot was let's get back to the fundamentals so that we have, and this is the time, space, resources, in order to ensure that there's expertise at those lower level executable tasks, the battle drills. And I've seen that over the last couple of years, we continue to, to build. And if you look at our CTC and our training rotations and the feedback from commanders in the field and, and the non-commissioned officers, we have built that level of capacity back and expertise at the lower level drills, literally up through to about company level live fires. And again, within the 90 days, what I've seen going back to the CTCs, that's great, but now we have to get to a 2.0. First, you have to maintain that foundation. You can't build a house on a foundation of sand. And the foundation of expertise at execution has to be maintained. So we won't take away from that. But the first level 2.0 that I talk about is where do you start synchronizing your warfighting functions? How do you get complementary effects on the battlefield? And that starts at the battalion level. So we have to look at means of multi-echelon training. How do we get to the point where we stress the battalions so they have a full understanding throughout the multi-domain what they're going to be able to bring to bear on the battlefield, and then we've got to build up that. And we're, we're good at the battalions, using CTCs as the kind of litmus test, but our battalions are outpacing our brigades, and as you can see, and the division is going to become our unit of action. But if you can't synchronize the battalion and the brigade, the division's not going to meet success and higher. So 1.0, we've got to maintain the fundamentals and the expertise at that echelon, and now the part we're going to start looking at and working with the commanders is, we've got to get to the point where we're synchronizing warfighting functions. And that's the battalion, build better competence, the brigade, and then look over the, over the, over the horizon and your planning horizon being probably a year to two years at a minimum, being able to then at the brigade to the division level. Do any of the other panelists have any thoughts on readiness and, and sinking the warfighting functions? I, if, if, if I might real fast. So, um, you know, in the 82nd, we always have to maintain an immediate response force. So it's, it's harder, uh, you know, to to balance all the things that have to be accomplished. The, one of the ways that we do this, and this isn't anything new, this was, you know, it's been done for a long time uh, in, in the 82nd, is our operational readiness cycles. Uh, and it's, you know, it, it's fundamental uh, that you follow it precisely. These are the tasks that you can accomplish in these cycles. You know, we have uh, very uh, specific guidance of who is doing all the tasking in order to free up the unit that's in the training window so they can get the highest state of readiness before their CTC rotation. So we can get them through a CTE, we can get them through a CTC rotation and get them on the, uh, on the earth. But it takes the whole division to be able to do that. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's so strict to the point uh, where the way I look at it, any exceptions to policy in this is we're building readiness to try to do multi-echelon training that, that the boss just talked about. 
any exceptions to that, I withhold at my at my level. So you know whether or not it's uh, you know somebody to deviate from outside of of uh, those specific cycles, uh, because that's the only way that we can ensure we get the reps and sets in at the lowest level, so we can get to the higher level uh, of of uh, training. And if I could just touch upon that, what Chris pointed out is at the division level, you see a lot of that is the predictability. And I think, in fact, I know that our SLA, we also have to build predictability at the enterprise level so that you can have that predictability through your cycle system. And also the strength of that, though, even if you're in your, your training cycle, if you're in your support cycle or your mission cycle, each one of those, you have echelons of training that you're allowed to do. So just because you're in a support cycle, you're not going to get up to the higher level collective task. You're not going to do company live fires. But you can do squad and platoon, or probably up to team, up to squad, and you get your flat ranges. So that when you transition out, and now you start to get to your training cycle, you can continue to build on that. So it never stops. And as you know, you continually have new soldiers that come in. You have to build that proficiency back. It never stops at the division level. It should never stop at the brigade. Then as we elevate that up, we've got to give predictability to the division so that you know when you're on your modernization, when you're on your training and others, and, and, and your third cycle for commitment. Okay. Uh, maybe I will uh, add something from the NATO perspective. Uh, NATO crea created high, high readiness force and low readiness force. High readiness force, especially VJTF, there are some brigade level co uh, com combat team who should be ready to fight in a very short period of time, the readiness se seven days. It means that uh, in the NATO, the countries which, uh, which are in, in this, uh, in this uh, readiness circle, in this uh, readiness table, they, uh, they uh, conduct every, every year the exercises which uh, and eval and are there evaluated with the CRIVAL evaluation, uh, evaluation tests. That's why uh, to compare with the, uh, with the U.S. troops, uh, if, if the U.S. ABCTs arrive to, to, uh, to Europe, generally we integrate them together with this high readiness forces which are uh, present in Europe uh, as a NATO response force. Thank you. Dr. McFate, do you have any academic perspective on readiness or any of the comments that have been made? Not that's any useful. Academics, you know. They can. <laughs> Believe me, I understand. <laughs> that, that's my favorite answer from <laughs> academics right there. <laughs> General Leneve, what are some of the unique challenges you face with the, um, the 82nd Airborne Division as far as readiness or in the general context of the changing character of warfare? Yes, I, I think, uh, I mean, we, we hit on you know, some of our stressors inside there is to maintain uh, you know, the immediate response force. It, not only do we have a brigade on that, the division uh, has the capability to, to uh, perform JTF you know, roles uh, to be able to execute on that. So as we, as we take uh, you know, a step back and take a look at what uh, you know, unit of action as it you know, elevates to the division, what well, how's that task org you know, work? Um, so the readiness uh, you know, uh, part of it, ROR speeds is how we get after it. Um, and that's how we try to maintain the highest state uh, of readiness. And as you pull a brigade out, you know, we migrate one more, you know, to the front uh, to try to get uh, the next brigade ready to go as fast as possible. The second part of your question is, uh, on the character. So uh, what we try to do is to continually transform inside the division. We're taking a look at everything. Uh, so we got a unique mission uh, in the 82nd. We're a Joint Forceful Entry Airborne Division. Uh, you know, and there's always, there's always great questions and, uh, you, know, um, you know, just based off of, of where I am, we're friends with all the other division commanders, we all poke fun of each other. You know, are you really ever going to execute, you know, large-scale airborne operation? It's mildly interesting. It's not really relevant. The Army's told me to prepare for it. So our division's got to be ready. We've got to be ready to be able to execute uh, one of the hardest tasks, and we'll audible off of that for whatever, we, uh, whatever we're told to do. But as you've taken a look at, you know, the technology, technology that's changing uh, and uh, the way to apply that, uh, uh, that technology uh, against a, uh, a near-peer threat, the way we do an airborne assault might be completely different. You know, the first pass across a drop zone might not be uh, heavies dropping and paratroopers dropping. It might be dropping out drones. Uh, and, and the ability for the drones to go down and understand exactly what the drop zone looks like, what the FLS looks like, the drones go out so we can have pinpoint uh, accurate 
uh, precision fires uh, on our enemy as soon as we drop um, to be able to use tools to let us know exactly where our door bundles are, what's in the door bundles, that should all populate on our equipment. So we're not out there doing an Easter egg hunt. We have exactly what we need on the, uh, on the battlefield. Uh, we should be able to talk across the division, to, you know, regardless of what platform. So all these things uh, we're, we're taking a hard look at of what the division needs to look like now, what the division needs to look like in five years, what it needs to look like in 10 years so we can meet whatever the, what the Army asks of us. Excellent, thank you. And that leads perfectly into an audience question um, for Dr. McVeigh. What are some of the key ways that warfare is changing today and what can the U.S. Army do to best prepare for future wars? So um, at the strategic level of war, which is kind of where I think about, war is becoming epistemological. What that means, it's um, epistemology and philosophy is like, how do you know what you know is true? And, or you see in the movie The Matrix, like red pill versus blue pill, that's what great powers, in great power competition, that's what they're trying to control. Um, and so, you know, why, you know, Russia and China both try to say, for example, hack our elections. We don't know how successful they are, but that's what they're trying to do. The strategic logic is this. You know, who cares about the sword if you can manipulate the mind that wields it? If you could, could, if you could help elect a president or a prime minister who's sympathetic to Chinese or Russian values, that's more important than, you know, a big, strong military. And so we have to think in warfare that part of modern warfare is information, as we've all discussed. We need technologies that can help make uh, Americans make better consumer choices about information without having, you know, censorship, et cetera. Um, and we need to rethink about what is war these days? Is it, you know, can there be war without bullets in the air? And I would argue that if it can, you know, if, if you can achieve your strategic war aims without firing a shot, that's a form of warfare. It's like Sun Tzu when you say the, the battle is won before the first shot is fired. And I think our adversaries are trying to use this because they know they can't go head on head with our military, so they're trying to find other oblique ways to, to conquer. Thank you. Major General Yokes, um, in the context of the changing um, warfare, what is some of the, or what are some of the most challenging obstacles you've had to overcome when it comes to building multinational forces? Uh, generally, uh, I, I, can, I can take uh, example from my previous, uh, previous position when I was the uh, commander of the Joint Force Training Center, NATO Joint, For Joint Force Training Center. We discuss about the changing uh, in the, in, on the battlefield, innovation, digitalization, uh, disruptive uh, technology, and some other aspects when the, uh, when the common operational picture, picture should, be, uh, should be used by all uh, our, our, uh, our partners. And generally, uh, talking about the interoperability, we see in the interoperability with the three, three aspects, there are the human, procedural, and uh, technological aspects. And generally, because no, some countries, they have uh, better, uh, uh, better, uh, better technological uh, aspects, they are, they are more modern. That's why it's so important, and, and the NATO started to create the coalition warrior interoperability exercises, which are conducted every, every year, where all the uh, NATO countries can come together with their the own uh, technology and we can plug in and test them. That's why also the NATO to see uh, some um, differences in this technological development started to implement the, the uh, NATO warfighting capstone concept for the, uh, for the uh, armies 2040 to help the NATO countries to better build the inter interoperability in this technological uh, aspects. That is something which will, will help us uh, from, I am talking from the Polish perspective, also talking with the, with the, with the US when the uh, CPC, we tried to, to connect with, with Jasmine and, and other uh, common operational pictures, and generally we were very successful. That's why the technological aspects, especially when we talk about the 30, 30 NATO countries, 
It's very important, it's very challenging. There are not obstacles, but there are challenges, and we are pretty, pretty successful to link uh, all our NATO countries with the same network. Excellent, thank you. Have any of our other panelists um, encountered other challenges, whether that be joint within our own, own US military or multinational? Anything that pops to mind? I have, I'd, I'd like to, to bounce one back just with what Dr. McFate spoke about when he talks about the, the character war, if I may. Please. Just, but, but, I think, but I think he's 100% right. And if you, if you look at, you know, nature war is the application of violence. It's a violent uh, in the nature and in and of itself. But you hit on a key point you know, with the character war, and I thought it was a great example that you use. And if you go back as a strategist and you throw Clausewitz, he uses the example of wrestling. And he has two wrestlers, and he uses the thing that they want to flip and then pin his adversary to deny him the ability to move and put him in a position of submission. Now it's a very granular example that he has. You can visualize it. It's kind of the mano mano fight. But you're looking at it now, and you look at it you now, fast forward these, these centuries, and look at it in the 21st century example using technology in order to put them in a position of a d disadvantage, using a, whether it's information technology, denying them ability and the fluidity of movement, and then pinning them in, in a sense in a political realm. And I think that's, that's the fight you have to have. How it manifests itself is in the ca characters of war, and you just hit on a key component to that. We've got to take ourselves away from just the tactical, the operational, but having to look at it at the strategic realm, and then build up the defenses first to identify, and then obviously negate or at least illuminate so it, like all lies, um, when brought to light. I would, I would add, I, absolutely, I mean, <clears throat> you know, if we focus too much on, you know, th there's always this saying um, that, you know, generals always fight the last war, especially if they won it, which obviously does not apply to any generals on this panel, um, uh, or room, or the next room, anyway. Um, <laughs> the, uh, you know, the, the, there is some of that. Um, and, and that's true for the national security community in Washington, right? I mean, there are people, in my opinion, which is wrong, is that they imagine that great power competition will be decided in the Straits of Taiwan. They're rethinking, you know, the Battle of Midway with Ford class carriers, F-35s, and drones. And it's a very tactical, operational, World War II view of the world. That's, I don't think, the future war looks like that. The changing character war doesn't have that even today. So one way you win strategically today is you wage war, but you make it look like peace to your adversary. You, you manipulate their paradigm of warfare. Many of you have seen this. Terrorists ride around the battlefield in an ambulance, right? They're manipulating our rules of engagement. Or they do things like in Poland, like Belarus launches refugees at Poland. You know, is that war? Is that peace? We don't know. We don't know how to respond to it. How many people are tired of cyber conferences where they spend the entire conference asking, it's a cyber attack, war, or peace? Right? It's like, enough. Let's get beyond that. The character of war is changing, and we have to change with it. And I think, in my opinion, we have to be more cunning. I think the best weapons are six inches between our ears. To that point, Dr. McFate, how do you see AI changing the character of warfare? Oh boy. Um, I'm a cyber skeptic. So, like, if any of you want your second career after, you know, 82nd, um, one thing you could do is every, every decade there's like a buzzword and you use it and then you put out your hands and money drops into your hands from DOD, right? So, 10 years ago, it was coin, right? You know, the coin McFate group, you know? Oh, money, money, money. And then now it's like cyber or AI, and just, you know, because nobody knows what it means. It's like, um, it's like anybody, like, dissertation, remember the movie, like, Gilligan's Island years ago? People write these dissertations about, it means, we don't know what it means. We, I mean, to, you know, look, AI, 15 years ago, Siri was AI. Now it's an app. Right? I think it's a moving target. I don't think AI is, I think there's a lot of jazz hands around AI. And AI cannot replace leadership, right? It can't replace leadership. So I think that there's, there's a role for uh, computer learning, but I, I think that some of its effects are more science fiction than reality. And, and the problem we have, I think, is we have policymakers, not in the military, who, who kind of like invest too much into what they think AI is based on what they were watching on TV last night. 
Yeah, I, if, if I could, because I want to use just one of your words or your, your phrase here. I, I just twist it a little bit. AI is a tool, like any other tool yep. we're offered right now. And it's, it's there if we want to use it to help that six inches that you just talked about between our ears. It's, there's a capability there, and we would be, uh, I think we would um, be remiss if we didn't take advantage of it sure. and learn from it and learn how to best use it for the application of whatever we're going to be asked to do. I, I would agree with that, yeah. Excellent. Another, uh, speaking of another tool in there uh, to use, a uh, great question from the audience. What is the role and value of lethal fires in today's environment, and how will that look in the future? And I'll open that to any panel member that wants to speak to it. Did you say lethal? Lethal fires. Yeah, I think it's a great question. The role of lethal fires in the future. I, I think there's always going to be a role for it. So on one spectrum, he talks about, uh, you know, war, uh, the, the way you described it, you got to have a fist to be able to get to that part. Lethal fires is the fist. Um, that the threat of that has a response from your adversaries as well. And if you don't have that, you'll never get to the part where you're you're uh, able to influence without having the ability to say we're going to utilize this. Um, I think we're we're observing you know lethal fires to some effects right now uh, on the battlefield now. To the extent that how well it's going to be, I, I think it would be hard for us to say, hey, here's our lessons learned right now. Like I said before, we're, we're in what I call the first quarter of, of this, uh, of this uh, you know, conflict here. Uh, but there are um, quick lessons to learn. I, you know, as we studied them, as we sat uh, in, in Poland uh, doing our assurance and deter mission with our partners, uh, you know, we, we tried every day to learn uh, techniques, tactics, and procedures that we would change. You know, how do we change counter fire? How do we protect ourselves from lethal fires? Taking a hard look at our mission command systems, taking a large uh, look at uh, our uh, EW um, transmissions. What do our, our uh, emplacement actually look like? Um, do, do we actually set up talks uh, the way uh, that we've been doing for years, or do we take a hard look at that and, uh, you know, see exactly how they're doing that? Uh, currently in the fight. I think lethal fires will always have a huge part on the battlefield. Please, sir. Mm, maybe I, I would like to, I like to add something uh, about the lethal fire. We see how important is speed, speed of the of decision, speed of, of, of the action. That's why how in the future we will, zero, we will use the artificial intelligence for the lethal fire, how the ro robotics will do this how the digitalization of the battlefield will change, will change this, this little fire to be more effective, and who will be faster, and who will kill whom earlier. Well, again, I, I will build upon what Dr. McFate spoke about. When you take a look, when he spoke about the Taiwan Straits and are we gonna fight the battle of Midway again, obviously uh, any of our adversaries doesn't wanna come against the strength of, of the United States or its allies. So if you can meet success, by doing it in an asymmetric manner. Obviously, you're gonna take that path and, uh, and, and you'll meet your goal. But if you do not meet that success, and then it, might, it may devolve back down into the ground combat operation that we spoke about before across all the domains. And that's where you see the confluence of how it manifests itself. And I think lethal fires is one of those components. So when you do move back into the tactical operational that we're seeing in the Ukraine, where they didn't meet it through asymmetric means, and now you're seeing a direct combat fight that's out there and it's gonna go Cross domain, then it's going to have to incorporate the new fires, and you're seeing the necessity for the long-range precision fires. How that's been a change around the on the battlefield itself, and the new technology we're bringing to, again, I talked about the HIMARS yesterday at the it's tactical and operational, double, triple that range, or put a zero on the end of it, and look what put it, what how it puts it at risk, and it changes then every dynamic across every war fighting function from your C2, your survivability, from space capabilities all the way down to your cyber. So I think there's always going to be a, you've got to be able to play across all spectrums of the warfare and how it's going to manifest itself based on the threat. So I think you do need to maintain that capability. If, if you can meet it by asymmetric means, that's wonderful. But if you can't, then you're going to be standing face to face ready to slug it out. Major General Yokes, an audience member asked what the relationship with Finland and Sweden will be like now that they're joining NATO. And do you see a long uh, period of training to get to that interoperability that you spoke about? 
good good example for, uh, to, to talk ab about the seed and, and, yeah. and finish is that this year, for example, during the exercise uh, Defender Europe, the Swedish troops, together with, with uh, the Fifth Corps uh, soldiers and uh, with, uh, with U.S. and Polish and uh, and also fr French components, they train together the long long range movement. They train together the water gap crossing. Generally, they were fully uh, compatible. Uh, if we talk about the equipment and the interoperability. Gen generally is almost at the same level like the, our old na NATO partners. That's why we just started uh, in the fifth core, the first exercises with Finland, which are very, very successful. That's why we don't see any, any obstacles or big challenges regarding the inter interoperability with the new, these new partners. Yeah, there's been a history of bilateral exercises, so it's not unique to have them incorporated into your exercise you've done. And this year we've seen a number of new ones. You've talked about Defender Europe, and then there's the Nordic exercise with the Marines annually go over there for a large exercise. But within the, with the European Union countries have done bilateral exercises, correct? Yes, generally talking about the, um, the NATO exercises yeah. or US uh, exercises related to NATO, uh, the Defender Europe or uh, uh, Rapid Trident exercise or Swift Response. Yeah. It's uh, something which is annually conducted from 2014, just after the Crimea was invaded. Generally, US, US, US Army Europe this time started this Defender Europe exercises and, uh, and Swift Response exercises. Uh, I, I really appreciate the 82nd because the 82nd was uh, the, the lead division for the, for the swift uh, response exercises which started in 2015, 16, and yeah. this year the swift response was conducted in the Baltic uh, countries to, to de deter Russia, to show the commit commitment. Generally, it was very, very successful exercise in, in, in Latvia where the paratroopers from 82nd, from 173rd, from other uh, NATO, NATO countries, together dropped uh, and jumped and seized the objectives uh, in, in, uh, in the Baltic states. The Defender Europe is the next example of uh, the very successful exercises. This year, they were coupled, uh, there, there were more than 15,000 soldiers from 19 countries engaged in this exercise. This exercise uh, was conducted uh, the long-range mov movement in, in Poland, Germany, Slovakia, and Baltic states, uh, as well as Denmark and Norway. Next year, Defender Europe is, uh, will be related with the, uh, with the uh, uh, south part of, of, of Europe. That's why it's very, very important and good exercise which helped to build the interoperability. What is worth to notice that this year, first, first, first time the fifth core was in lead of this exercise. The fifth core created the uh, combined high con for this exercise with the Polish Land Component Command. And in Krakow was established the uh, full uh, command element with uh, all, all the system which we, uh, which we uh, co connected, the Polish mission network, the feder federated mission networking, and the MPE, the US MPE, which started to connect all uh, NATO, NATO alliance was very, very, very successful. Nicole, in the maritime domain, the, the Swedish Navy just, it was the 500th or 800th anniversary of the Swedish Navy, and the CNO was over there. We had four different mm -hmm. capital ships that were there. The chairman went over, and they've done a number of exercises with the Swedish Navy, that they've done with the entire area. So there's already been connectivity that's been in there. And you've seen that those countries, many have already nested within our capability sets. Yeah, we got the opportunity, uh, you know, as they were discussing, uh, you know, their decision to, to apply to join NATO to be able to send a rifle company uh, to Finland to participate um, in some exercise there, and it was uh, very, very well received. I appreciate the Navy shout out, sir. Always, always nice. Um, Gen <laughs> the only one, right, Joint staff. <laughs> um, General Leneve, uh, we've touched on it a little bit, but one of the audience members um, asked how, uh, if you could share some of the ways the U.S. is working with allies and partners in support of Ukraine. Yeah, so uh, the, the first one, you know, the, the mission uh, to assure and deter, uh, 
you know, join with uh, our partners along the border there uh, in Poland uh, with Ukraine. So um, it, you read in the news and, and you know, of, of all the different uh, assets that's been uh, sent across the border. So I, w I won't touch on that. I will touch on uh, the incredible uh, training opportunities we've had to be able, we've been able to execute with uh, our, uh, all of our allies across there. Um, we had a, a combined joint, uh, our JOC, uh, so we had multiple partners inside our JOC as we were able to not only understand what's going on in Ukraine, understand what's going on on the border, uh, and understand uh, what all the donor nations uh, were uh, bringing to, uh, to the fight. Additionally, um, we have got to be able to do, you know, multi-echelon training uh, with uh, the division that I was partnered with. Uh, with was the 18th mecha mechanized division and we were able to exchange at the highest staff levels inside the division and our third brigade uh, was able to execute you know multiple live fires uh, combined arms live fires with them um, so uh, you know not only to understand uh, you know the struggles that were going on across the border but to understand and try to assist uh, with all the allies you know with their with their help so what I would tell you uh, is, and, I, and I'd be remiss if I, if I you know, passed over this, um, one of the points I did want everybody to understand is, is when we look back on history and look back on this time, uh, history is going to look very, very favorably at the, uh, the Polish nation. There was not uh, maybe a handful of uh, soldiers and officers that I talked to that did not, so just a handful that did not. The vast majority of officers, uh, soldiers, non-commissioned officers in the Polish army that I was partnered with had Ukrainians that they've never met before living with them. Uh, that as they came across the border, uh, they opened up their homes uh, to uh, you know uh, uh, families that they had never met before, and it's been incredible uh, to to watch that and be a part of that. Um, I think you know as as we go back and and uh, you know learn lessons from this, what was amazing from a NATO perspective is how fast they were able to mobilize, how fast the international community was, be, was able to mobilize and to be able to get uh, the support across uh, the international community uh, for the plight of the Ukrainian people. And I'm going to put you on the spot for a sec, because we're talking about now that you got the monthly donor commissions and all the different countries that are committed to that. But the commitment of the actual ground forces to go over there that were part of the Assure element, and I look at Romania with the French, and you've got the partner nations that have all moved throughout the area, and it's battalions with the capability to expand in a posture to the brigade. But how quickly, and I give General Walters incredible credit for coalescing and get the whole team together as the UCOM commander, but could you just touch upon where those, all the multiple countries from NATO had, had committed forces throughout other countries? And then the commitment of, I mean, you've got patriots in Romania, you've got German patriots in Romania, you've got Americans up in area. So the commitment of the ground forces and capabilities that are there yeah. and air. And we, we, we observe still, you know, the, the huge commitment from, uh, from, the, from the other NATO countries, uh, which support the, uh, the, 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 the front countries, the, it means the, the, the Baltic, Baltic yeah. states, Poland, uh, Slovakia, Bulgaria, Romania, and Hungary. Generally, there's a the, the, the really, really huge effort, and we, we see the, the, this uh, NATO commitment. Thank you. Dr. McFate, um, I love this question, um, and I, what do you think, speaking of the different technologies we've covered, yeah. what are the most overrated and underrated technologies? Wow, okay. First of all, I, I don't work for Silicon Valley, so that, I'm not sure how that shades your, and I also want to get back to something uh, General Deneve said, is that um, AI is important. Um, I think the closer you are to uh, the tactical and operational levels of war, it's, it's a critical tool to sort of basically crunch information for the warrior to make decisions. Uh, at the strategic level, I think it has diminishing returns. Um, in terms of technology, I think the most overrated technologies um, are things you know, like that support that are purely for conventional warfare. Um, this is controversial, but I, I do think that conventional warfare is waning uh, and may be dead. Um, you know, if you look at a graph of, you know, of warfare since 45, uh, conventional warfare is like flatlined, whereas every other type of armed conflict goes up and up and up. Um, and there's lots of social science data to prove it, and I think a lot of vets would just intuitively know that. 
So yet we're, we're investing, the Department of Defense is investing most of its um, money on conventional warfare weapons and those technologies that support that. Uh, and I would also say for some, I can see the thought bubbles out here. Wait, isn't Putin waging a conventional war right now, McFate? What's going on? And my response would be, he started a conventional war, it failed, and he pivoted to sort of a Russian unconventional war, which is basically war by atrocity and you know, things that they did in Grozny, Aleppo, and now in parts of Ukraine, that's not really conventional war. Um, so I think those types of battlefield victories, like robots that can, you know, land on the beaches of China and, you know, I don't know what they're gonna do, march in. Um, but the things that we need more of are, are in the information domain. Like, you know, disinformation uh, is a weapon of war in many ways. Uh, and we need to, to make Americans smarter about it. So, for example, we all know the problem of clickbait, right? Well, we also have clothes on us that say, you know, where it's made, like made in USA. Uh, for some of you, it's like made in Milan, made in Paris. For me, it's like made in Vietnam. But, you know, the, the point is, is that if you could put a label on clickbait, made in North Korea, made in Russia, made in Iran, could that influence consumer choices in a positive way? Um, so we, as a democracy, we've got to be very careful. We don't want to try to manipulate information, but we also don't want to be manipulated by adversaries' disinformation. Hey, can I jump in there? Please. I can pass this one up. So, uh, we, you, you, when you, when you take a look at investment, I, say, I don't discount what you're saying. I don't want you to think that I, I discount that. So I, I think our senior leaders uh, struggle every day to ensure that they're putting resources in the right pots. But if, if we don't put resources in conventional arms, uh, at least in the conventional arms that, as we're modernizing right now, then there's a great opportunity for us to all learn a different language sooner or later. Yeah. Okay, so I, I, think, I think there's a balance act that has to be made there. Uh, because I, I go back to it, you, you might call it conventional. We still got to, you still got to pivot from a position of strength, and the backbone of that strength is every one of the. Well, it's 19,000 paratroopers that I, I get the opportunity to serve with, but it's every one of the service members uh, and their families inside the DoD, and the way we equip them, the way we resource them, the way we support them, is just as important as that you know, other side that you talk about to be able to, you know, fight and win before you have to employ forces. But you got to be able to have the capability and those forces have got to be ready to be able to smash somebody. Uh, and if they're not, we at the tactical level are failing our country. Sure. I, I'm pro smashing. Yeah. And I do think that we have to look at this as it, it almost bifurcates because if you look at what just took place in Europe, and I'll take it back to the army that we have today that's out there. And the army that you saw from Desert Storm forward, the way that we trained, the way that we built that, I remember the old book, Prodigal Soldier, that brought us forward to where we're at. And you saw it dominate literally from Desert Storm. And then our ability when this, when this crisis arose over in Europe, you saw our ability to put two armor brigades over there. And the, immediately on the continent, surrounding these countries, around the, your, your Article Five nations. So the ability to project that combat power that was at a high steady readiness, you have to have the combat capability on the conventional sense. That hasn't taken us to a conventional war. But one of the things that we're, I wouldn't say struggling with, but we're also discussing is, but those formations, that force structure, that capability of conventional, if you were to shift that into an Indo-PACOM theater, is it maneuver brigades you know, on a continent? Is that really a realistic fight? If not, what would that fight look like? And that's where I think we talk about what type of technology we think is overrated, but what is that that we have to bring forward in technology for the future fight? Hypersonics, long range, you know, the ubiquitous sensors that are out there all the time. I think AI is helpful, as you said, at the right echelon because the terabytes of data have to be analyzed quickly and that, that's for the, the speed of decision making and that's where we'll find our advantage in, in that talk about the character war in the future fight. But I do think we have to look at it. I'm not sure our conventional forces are obsolete at this time, no matter what your brothers say about airborne capability. They're but, wrong. <laughs> they're wrong. And, but we do have to look at what the future fight, what that structure and capabilities we have to bring to bear. And that's why I talked about modernization and the temporal nature of the fight. And it's regional too. And what is the threat that we're facing, the force we have to create to thwart that threat? 
Can I ask a question, actually, it is, as a follow-on? In, I think you're correct, Indo-PACOM, different, maybe arguably different way of war, character of war. Do you think China can, quote, win by, they want to win by 1 October 2049. That's their suspense date, by the way. Uh, it marks the 100th anniversary when they went over the nationalists in Taiwan. Do you think that t China can, quote, win with, and avoid large-scale combat operations? Did you say 29 or 49? 20, uh, it's 100th. Yeah, yeah uh, 2049. Do you think they can, whatever winning looks like for them, do you think, like, regional hegemon hegemony or whatever, do you think they can do that with or and avoid LISCO, or is it kind of... Well, a lot of, yeah, again, hypothetical. And we get yeah. into, first, I think I'd have, you know, as we have, pro, you talk about strategic fight, yeah. you know, everybody likes the operational and the tactical, but you have to go back and say, if I'm, a, if I'm on the Chinese side, I'd be interested in their strategic policy of define winning, what are those end states you're trying to achieve? And then I'd look, I'd say at this point, no, because you also have your ability of, you know, contested deterrence and their ability to engage. But I'd, I'd be very interested to see what their definition of what winning is. And again, you don't want to escalate to a threshold as they're building an incredible nuclear capacity. That's, that's not winning for anybody, yeah, for humanity at writ large. But I, I wouldn't be able to answer a hypothetical that. Can I, they win I by 49? But anyway, yeah. I do think that you're going to still see a, con a competitive nature of the escalation in the area in competition at this point. Thank you. Shifting us a little bit, General Pappas, how does engaged leadership and leadership continuity contribute to readiness 2.0? Uh, well, we just talked strategic at the 2049. <laughs> I'll tell you, it's just leadership today. And as I look, you know, I'll take green suitors in the back and I say what we grew up with. Uh, engaged leadership, and I know that I think there's a SAMS throughout there earlier that said, sir, it's leadership. You can't put a quantifier in engaged. Engaged leadership, I'm saying it. And what that means, it's that human dimension, it's that fingertip level, it's the name tag level engagement. I talked about it this morning, it's, it starts at PT. It's knowing the human dimension of the formation that you're a part of. If you're a team leader, you should know your team and your team should know you. You should know every aspect of the individual, you should know what their family is, you should know where they live, you should understand what their goals are, what is their inspiration, what is it that motivates them, and then it's a two-way conversation, that conversation come back, so that they can also, you as a leader understand, and they can articulate to you what it is or challenge they're having or where they want to go. So not for you to carry them there, but for you to provide them the tools and the guidance to get to that, that level. And that's solving it. And I tell you, and that's also, you know, physical presence to me is very important. Physical presence starts at 0630 PT. You know, this is part of my mantra. When you fall in, you see each other, that's when you see if issues arise. You have that human touch point that starts at the very beginning of the day. And then your right face, you take off for PT. You want NCO time, it starts right there because you're leading it on a plan to get stronger, get fitter, and have that communication. And it continues on into the field because as you move up an echelon by rank, whether you're now the corporal, the sergeant, the lieutenant, or higher, you've got things to share and build in that organization. And it's about building a team. And that team is built over time and it's built on trust. And it's built by the communication, just like any relationship that you have. And that's one of the points you talked about, the transitional nature. You'll see a lot of the units that have less turnover at the, uh, at the E5 level, at the E7 level, 6-7 level. You start seeing lesser incidents of, of misconduct. Why? Because you're able to be much more predictive. You understand where that is. There's a trust of something's arising that that leader can engage and be proactive in solving the problem. Continuous turnover, you can bring a person in and they probably have the same technical skills, but what they don't have is that interpersonal relationship. And that's, again, the Army especially, it's about people. And people's the human dynamic that we have to continue to build upon and build sustainability and, sus and that trust. Again, it comes through time, effort, and shared experience. Please. I would, li I would like to add something, sir, from the NATO perspective, how we, uh, in, the, in, Euro in the European theater, how General Kolaszewski as a core commander, how be he, been, uh, he is engaged with his contact partner, with the other, uh, uh, other NATO corps to build order of this, this relationship. The same, the division commanders with the division commanders, brigade, ABCT commanders with other uh, bri uh, NATO bri brigades, it means that this, a relationship which you mentioned generally is not only with the subordinates uh, but also with, with the neighbors and our international partners which we notice that is at the, at the highest level and 
we really appreciate for this. And, and I use the example of, you know, the, at, the, at the lower echelon of the, the team and the squad, but it's, it is at echelon. It's your span of control. The brigade commanders got the battalion commanders, battalion commanders, company commanders. You know, for me, it's, it's the core and the separates. And I should have that level of fidelity and understanding that we might not fall in every morning at 6.30 where I look at them, but I should have those routine touch points and know everything about them, their individuals, and even at, at this little bit of an advanced age, they still have aspiration goals and family things that are going to affect them. And I should know that. Okay, let me, if, if I could, go back, because it's pretty interesting up here. It's, it's four paratroopers and Navy. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, uh, I'm going to go real fast. This is one of the things I love about the 82nd Airborne Division. Um, and and I, I've served in uh, almost every light division, but the 82nd, a little bit different, is at the core of it. Uh, when, you, when you start your airborne timeline, everybody's a rifleman. Whether you're a division commander uh, or you know uh, a rifleman, everybody's the same. We have the same mission. Once we uh, we we jump out of the aircraft, we talk about trust. Hey, I'd like to lay it out a different way, and it's a it's a, a picture of we're all following a jump master, probably a yet a young uh, NCO or a young uh, officer in our formation. And it doesn't matter where you are inside the formation. Again, division commander down to the lowest level. We're keeping our eyes on a jump master. They're taking us through uh, the airborne timeline. They're taking us through JMPI procedures, checking our, our parachute to make sure we're right. They're putting us on the aircraft. They're standing us up. They're checking our equipment, uh, making sure that our bodies are in the right position. And we're waiting for them to tell us to go. That's trust. That's leadership. Uh, and so you can mimic that across our formation. Uh, and, and, I'm, and I'm hoping it's happened every day. You know, whether or not you're on our dens, um, you, you know, you should be inside of a formation or at least running with you know some people if you're a leader uh, because it's such a short amount of time that you have an opportunity to serve uh, alongside these incredible human beings that have raised their right hand twice and said yes I'll join the United States Army and yes send me to an airborne division that if you're a leader inside the 82nd you have such a small amount of time to be part of that that I want them at you know at every level where people are engaged um, I, I always say leadership, I'm going to change to engage leadership, uh, but you know, it's, uh, it's following, uh, you know, task conditions and standards and understanding what those are, uh, and living up to each other. Cause we're all, we're all beholden to each other, especially on a drop zone someplace. It's very inspiring. I appreciate those sentiments. Thank you. Um, and General Leneve, you, you opened a door to the next question that we got. Um, and this is for you, General Yokes. It's my understanding that um, NATO allies keep soldiers and leadership in positions longer than the U.S. military tends to do. Have you seen negatives and positives for the increasing that length of time? Uh, generally, in the NATO, there are three years rotation. In the U.S., two, two years rotation. Uh, as, of course, there are advantages and dis disadvantages of this. The, this, the advantages that uh, every two years you can share with your experience from the previous position and uh, for, the, for the next, uh, next position, for the ne next people. And generally, you have more experience uh, if you change ev every two years. Uh, in the NATO three-year cycle, it uh, helps, you know, the, the, the one reason is that the first year usually you familiarize with the environment, especially with this international environment. You integrate the people in, the, in this environment and then effectively you, you work two years on, on the position. Because, you know, uh, if you work uh, in this multinational environment, when I was commander of the Joint Force Training Center, I have people from the 19 countries and of, of course, to, to learn different culture and to integrate them, and it takes more time. Excellent, thank you. This builds off on many of your comments, but what are some of the factors and elements in building and sustaining individual resilience in our soldiers? Well, I, so um, you got the, I'd like to pivot on what you, you just talked about because we had a really important panel earlier today that talked about services, services for our families, services for our, our, uh, our paratroopers that they can uh, take advantage of. So uh, I think resiliency inside of our formations uh, is what General Pappas actually talked about too. It's the, the leadership actually understanding uh, what 
makes our, our paratroopers uh, our go. You know, so that they understand where they're from, they understand what, uh, you know, stressors are on them. Um, I think training helps build resiliency. Uh, our, uh, our H2F, um, uh, which is a uh, holistic health and fitness uh, program, helps us build resiliency. Um, all of the resources, like I said, uh, for our family members helps build resiliency. Our, our strategic deployment platforms, all of those uh, holistically uh, build re resiliency inside of our formation. Now, I think uh, Mr. Mr. Uh, reporters out there, so I think we're, we're stabilizing all of the soldiers and paratroopers inside the 82nd Airborne Division, so that'll help us build resiliency too uh, inside our formation. Um, but, you know, all those together uh, are important for command, and these are all tools to help us to uh, make sure that we're getting the very best out of uh, each one of our, our team members. Any thoughts from any other panel members? Uh, just this, and I, I fully agree, and I thought the panel this morning did an excellent job as you look at that. One of the things I'd like to expand beyond, we talk about the resilience, and we, you know, we continue to talk about, and I spoke about the formation, everybody in uniform, but it's the family being incorporated into it also. And as we look at some of these capstone training events where we built the team from the, from the team level up through your, your training cycle, we get out there, we do company live fires, and we feel very proud of ourselves. We go to an NTC or a JTR, JRTC, and and we walk out of there and we're at the we're at the apex of our we're at the apex of our, our unit in training and camaraderie and then we come back and i think one of the key pieces is that's a time that you have to then take a step before you come back and say hey you've been away for 10 days and you just release everybody you know back to the to the family take an opportunity at that point now is the time you have to incorporate the family Bring them in before you release them so that as the team has been built, that's the team within the uniform, but now they're bringing the family in. Whether, whatever formation, whatever approach you want to take, whether it's, you know, an organization day or just a, a picnic day, but cut time into your training schedule on the back end to then bring the family in so they can now be a part of this portion of your training plan, and then they'll feel, they'll feel more a part of the organization. And that also helps as you've got touch points with that individual that's in uniform with you, but it'll also give you touch points with the family themselves, whether it's the spouse or the children or the parents, whatever that multi-generational family may be there, but it gives you insight understanding and brings them into the team. It also gives them the opportunity to meet others that are part of that same team. There might not be a form if it's not there. That also builds resiliency into the formation writ large. And I'll tell you, during deployments, those family units are absolutely imperative. You talk about the intangibles of combat and combat effectiveness, it starts right there. General Yokes, do you have any perspectives from the, the Polish Army um, and readiness and resiliency? Uh, generally, it's similar like, here, like in, the, in the US Army. You know, the training, which is always very intensive and we, we, we spent uh, a, lo a lot of time on the, on the training areas. It's very, it's very important to inte integrate them to get together and to, to build, build the team. Excellent. Thank you. Dr. McFate, we've talked technology, we've talked readiness. Um, what is the one question you think we're not asking? Well, there's so many, right? Uh, I don't want to get hypothetical. Um, you know, I, I guess the, the question is, um, and this is again a strategic perspective, but from where I sit in Washington is that, um, you know, about less than 1% of the country serves in uniform. And this creates problems uh, in our foreign policy decision making because I, I feel like our armed forces are getting more distant from the people that they serve, and it's very easy to sort of be bellicose. Let's go to, you know, let's invade, let's go to Ukraine, you know. Um, and it's very easy if you don't actually have to be the one to do it. Um, and this is creating what we call moral hazard in public policy making. And I don't know what the answer is for that. We have less veterans serving in Congress. Um, we have, in my opinion, members of Congress who really are there to become Twitter stars. Um, so how do, we, how do we have a, we can't have a mature discussion about foreign policy, national security, if the majority of the American people really are not dialed into it. I don't know how to fix that. Any other comments on that question? 
Okay, so I've got a big one from the audience, and this is open to anyone. What is the Army's biggest challenge to provide trained and ready forces to the Joint Force Commander in the 21st century? I'll take that on. I'll tell you right up front, it's time. It's time of the demands. We talk about the force element requirements, and it's the temporal nature of it. As we look at the demand on the force elements, Army specific, and I can speak to the 93 crew des in the Navy and how they're just getting wore out. But in the Army itself, the demand on our formations, and it's not just our maneuver formations, when you look at your down trace, combat service and combat service support, they're being consumed in the current fight in these times of competition. And you can see, in the, and again, I, and, I, and having lived it and haven't seen it and been part of the narrative, and, and they are eloquent narratives and each one is, is viable and justifiable if I'm a combatant commander, because it's what you have asked me and directed me to do through orders. And if you want me to do this, here's the requirements that I have and you have to source me to do that. And to meet the depth of the requirements, it's almost like 350-1, 365 days, you can't do everything that's in there. We can't meet all of them, so how do we meet her? Possibility and probability. Probability of action if you don't get this resource, and that's a narrative that goes on continuously. So why do I bring that up? Is there's a continuous demand and a drumbeat for these force elements. I've talked about giving predictability, these eight month cycles, so you know when you're gonna modernize, when you're gonna train, then an eight month horizon when, I'm gonna, when the military's gonna be able to commit you into deployment. But if you start to consume beyond that, that we've already predicted to be capable to be deployed, now you're gonna to have to start taking into the training element. So you're gonna minimize some of the training capacity. Or you're gonna to have to cut back on some of the modernization. I can't let this unit modernize this year because I have to put another organization over into name your combatant command because there's a threat and there's a risk and there's forces at play there. So that's one of the critical components that we have and it is a, it's an intricate and delicate balance. Uh, and right now we're, we, we are a little bit out of balance uh, to meet the projected fight. So we meet in the daily requirements today, but if you sacrifice your modernization capability, then you, my question is, are we gonna be prepared for that future fight, the 2029 or the 2049? Because if you don't start modernizing today, you're gonna fight 2029 with what you see today. This is gonna be a little bit older. General Aniv, what are some of the initiatives that the 82nd Airborne Division is taking on to prepare for these future conflicts? We're taking a hard look at uh, how our formation looks. Um, are we, uh, I, I tell people I want the 82nd to be uncomfortably light and increasingly lethal. And what does that mean? So um, we have an incredible amount of, uh, of uh, extra uh, pieces of equipment that we've acquired over the years that's draining our resource. Our resource is not only mechanics, our money, our time. Um, so we've, uh, we've taken on, um, in the last week and a half, we've turned in close to 80 pieces of equipment, all Humvees. The goal is over the next couple months to get 500 pieces in. And I'm, I'm telling everybody that's the first quarter. We're taking a look at uh, exactly what we're supposed to look like. The goal would be um, our formation would have a single uh, chassis vehicle. Um, our brigades would be uh, lighter, faster. We would be able to task organize faster for missions. The 82nd's seconds deployed four times on the earth in the last two years, four times. We've had a task organize to be able to execute that mission. And as we've left people back, We've had to you know, put them under different types of uh, command and control. So as we take a look at what the division unit of action looks like, how do we set up ourselves to be able to task organize quickly, but still keep people under proper command and control so they can continue to train in case they're the next echelon that has to go. So we're taking a hard look at that. We're taking a hard look at uh, every piece of equipment. Can you hurl it out of an aircraft? Uh, or can it come in uh, in a, uh, a C-17 as an air land? How do we need to preposition uh, parts of our uh, formation so we can quickly draw equipment and we can present a lighter force uh, to our, our air force as they deliver us to the battlefield? We're taking a look at uh, exactly what our formation should be equipped with. Um, how, you know, how, do, how do we fight? Our, our bread and butter is the airfield seizure. How do we do that quicker? How do we do that lighter? How do we do that with robotics? How do we do that with UAVs? Should the division uh, have a cross-domain reconnaissance capability? What does our UAS and robotics actually mean inside of our division? We have this incredible network called 
uh, ITN that helps us to talk digitally with each other, but some of our formations can't talk to each other because they haven't been equipped with it. So how do we spread that across right now and get lessons learned from our CTCs to, uh, to enable us uh, to you know, project into the future what we actually need to look like? And, and uh, you know, we, we take a look at well, how we were formed in the past through a lens of learning through history, but we're, we're going forward with uh, all the technology um, to enable us to be a better fighting force. And then on the other side of it, I talked about holistic health and fitness, but, you know, we, today is a week and a half into our first test on an app to, for paratroopers to be able to order their meal uh, from the DFAC and grab and go. You know, right now it's having pretty good success with uh, one of our brigades that's out there training for the, uh, for the ESB and the EIB. We're trying, to, we're trying all this new technology, but at the end of the day, what I still tell everybody is, you're not gonna use a QR code in order to seize an airfield. So you still gotta be able to execute that mission, but our technology will enable us to be able to be better at our formations. Um, so we're, tra we're testing that out. We have, uh, we're testing multiple different uh, uh, equipment sets for the Army as we look at what uh, platforms we're gonna modernize on. So that's one of the great things about being in, in the 82nd, we get the opportunity to test some of this, provide feedback, not only the uh, Futures Command, but uh, to, uh, to the Army writ large. And a compliment to you, Chris, and your team. It's not just your fighting force, but your outload capacity, and you learn great lessons. On one of these uh, deployments, they, they didn't come out of Fort Bragg. They had to come out of Charleston to set the conditions for that, and what does a streamlined capability to push out and still meet the mission, and you were able to do that actually in record time, earlier than their time horizons of your own off your own uh, standards. Sure, they appreciate that. The goal, the goal would be, you know, a piece of equipment. Yeah, you, you drive up on something and the lasers take a look at everything and it tells you, you know, the weights, the loads, the center of it, and that populates into our, our uh, systems of record and we can quickly get our load plans done and, and get out of here. So uh, we're trying to look at every different way to be able to optimize this. I tell you, you had me at though for a moment. You talked about being uncomfortably light, and I had to look at General Allen. When General Allen was Major Allen, I was a young captain. We were trying that in the 82nd, and we had that jump into Canada. And they said, we're going to jump without rucks, and you'll let it catch up to you. You got to trust your log base. And we weren't uncomfortably light. We were uncomfortably cold, because that for the first two days, <laughs> our rucks never made it. They, they ended up in Bangor, Maine or something in a broken aircraft. So yeah, we were pretty close to the formation that night. So. Travel light, freeze at night. Yeah, I love Canada. We, we couldn't have done it in June. We had to do it in February. Yeah. Sorry about that. Did you have something to add? Yeah, what I would like to add, generally the innovation and modernization process, they will, they will drive the development of our army. That's why it will be so important, this talent management and how we will prepare our future uh, leaders to use this technology to, uh, to have the, the ability to, tra to train the people to be, uh, and how then to change the structure of the, of the, of the army to, for, uh, to better use this uh, new modern equipment. It's harder on leaders today. I, I, this is way harder for them. Um, no, it sounds awesome. Uh, I, I think it's way harder on our on our leaders today. They have a, a lot of distraction uh, that's pulling them away, but they have to learn uh, all the technology that we have, but at the same time, they have to be prepared to execute all of it when the technology fails them. If we lose GPS, if we lose the ability to talk, if we lose you know, the ability to get uh, you know, some of our higher technological platforms in, they still have to close with and destroy the enemy. Uh, so I think they have it a lot harder than I had it when I was a lieutenant. Now, I'll never admit that, uh, but, you know. I think you just I did, I think sir. I just did. <laughs> is, this, is, this, is this working? Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I want to make sure we have time for everybody to give closing remarks. So, Dr. McFade, if you would start um, with any uh, final words you have concerning our topic today. Um, sure, briefly. So I think that the, the character of warfare is changing. Uh, I think it's a race between us and our adversaries who can get there first. And that, you know, war in 2040 may not, you know, look like it we think it does. We could be like the French behind their Maginot line thinking that we're very secure, or China could as well. The other thing I want to mention that may be a little controversial is that 
as the character of warfare changes, should the laws of armed conflict change with it? Right? I mean, what should the laws of armed conflict look like if we don't think that they're serving us today? Or are they serving us? We know adversaries exploit it for their advantage. So um, I'll sort of leave it, move it a little bit from technology to morality and, and the future war. Thank you. Thank you. General Yost? Uh, it is my hope that you leave here today with the following takes away. We must adopt to future threats. This means learning from the conflict in Ukraine and anticipating what the future battlefield will look like. The one who learns, uh, adopts, and integrates fear first will likely win. And combat ready means you are ready now with the AI, uh, aid towards the future. And the last but not least, the interoperability has to be continuous and enduring process because usually we will fight as an alliance. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. General Anip. Yeah, first off, uh, what an honor to be here and to be on the panel with, uh, with this team here. And, uh, you know, AUSA, thanks for coming to, I'd say, Fort Bragg in Fayetteville. Um, this, is, this is great for, for all the opportunities for the, the team it has to be able to see. So I, I tell you that um, your, your 82nd Airborne Division uh, is embracing and running as fast as we can to transform the division, uh, to maintain uh, the standards and discipline you know us of, uh, but to understand that we know we have to change in order to be able to be as lethal uh, and as deployable as possible. And we have the greatest, greatest uh, asset uh, on the planet, and it's the paratroopers that are sitting in the back right now uh, that represent 19,000 of them at uh, Fort Bragg and their families that uh, call this place home. And they're ready to go tonight. We have a brigade on the ready uh, at all the time. So it's an honor to be here. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, that's great. And I do appreciate it. And for General Brown to have AOSA come down, I said, harvesting this, migrating it down from D.C. down to, to Fayetteville and Fort Bragg. Much appreciated. And it's, these are the discussions we have to have. And when you talk about getting them outside of, you know, just the D.C., you have to expose this to other parts, even if it's a military town and community. These are the discussions that help propagate the information and, and let others understand it. When I, when I took battalion and brigade command forward, again, 20 years of continuous combat, I always would lead off and I'd look at the commander and say, look, our future is written. We're going to war. Tim Leone's heard that a few times. Because, and I tell him, we're on a patch start. At this time, we're going to be in Iraq, and we're going to be fighting Diyala Valley. We're going to be in the Kunar River Valley, or we're going to be here. So for four different deployments over four years, we're able to have that level of predictability. I can't do that in this job, to that level of specificity. But what I will tell you, the future is written. That's why you have a nature of conflict and a changing character of war, because there is, war is something that will continue forward. And it's our responsibility to be ready and prepared to win that first fight in the next war. And that's the job with, within Forcecom. It's the job with all the commanders and every soldier out there to embrace that and be prepared for that. And I appreciate, because having Dr. McFade here and others like him, to challenge our assumptions, to push it. And for Colonel Hayden there, I saw you get a little nervous. He said, do we have to look at the law of war, law of long conflict? And he shook a little bit, because uh, he was one of our JAGs when I was a young in here before. But we have to have these discussions and have these assumptions out there and we have to talk about the way we train. What is the change of character war? What are the constants? And what do we have to be prepared for? And I'll tell you, by theater. And we have to be prepared to set that up. It only comes from in-depth, analytical, educated discussions at every echelon. And these forums, thank you, General, are the ones that set those up. Thank you. Thank you to the audience for the wonderful questions. And thank you to AUSA for having us. If we could get a warm round of applause for our wonderful panel. And happy birthday to Command Sergeant Major Sims. And happy birthday to Command Sergeant Major Sims. Yeah. Thank you all very much. Enjoy the rest of the symposium. <laughs>
All right, before everybody uh, sneaks out of here, just a, a real quick, you're heading the right direction. There's a reception next door, starts in a few minutes, out on the floor. Uh, don't miss that, great opportunity. Fantastic first day with the panels. Also, we need, uh, you know, we've got a couple leaders in the battle challenge. Uh, the male category, two minutes is the fastest time. Female, it's about 3.44. So we need some more folks over there. Tremendous prizes for that. It'll be open tomorrow. Uh, get a good night's rest. Be ready for the battle challenge. Finally, uh, we'll kick off Thursday tomorrow morning with the Chief of Staff of the Army, who already arrived. He's already here. 9 o'clock, we'll kick off with the Chief. Uh, see you at the reception. Thanks.